Um, the topic that I'd like us to consider today is the one I've put on the title slide, namely thermal noise. It's a very rich topic. It's got beautiful physics in it, dirt physics in it, um, everything that, that you might um, uh, want in a, in a noise source. Um, it's a rich enough topic that I'll be introducing it today before lunch and we'll come back and look at some of the same topics uh, in the tutorial session this afternoon. So you'll, you'll notice that I find it charming in its own right, but the only reason that it fits in a uh, summer school course on gravitational wave astronomy is that thermal noise turns out to be one of the most important and actually one of the most recalcitrant noise sources in our noise budget. And remember that one organizing overarching theme you might see in, in the set of lectures that, that I'm presenting here is that we're building up an understanding of key components of the noise budget of any gravity wave detector and we're using advanced LIGO as, as our example. And recall that two days ago we learned about estimating uh, the shot noise level. And this was, if we did things right, 3 times 10 to the minus 24 per root hertz. And then yesterday we saw that at 10 hertz and lower there's going to be a very steep wall from seismic noise. And this idea of not needing to look at signals below some frequency, from many points of view, that's a terrible catastrophe because there's signals down there and interesting information. On the other hand, given all the other difficulties that we face, um, I think I kept hearing Bala saying, all right, well, all we need to do is make things right, make our templates right within the sensitive band and that we don't have to do it perfectly. And there's a, lot of, there's a lot of things, not just, I'm not just making fun of the difficulty of, of calculating accurate templates. There's a, a lot of things where you get let off the hook. Once there's one unsoluble problem, okay, then we could, don't have to worry about some other problems that, that might confront us. So, so this was shot noise, this was seismic noise. And it turns out that there are two flavors of thermal noise, thermal noise that come from two aspects of um, the mechanical parts of the interferometer that end up being important uh, limits to our sensitivity. And they both end up kind of in this corner. There's a relatively shallow spectrum and a somewhat steeper spectrum coming from two different aspects of Brownian motion of the mirrors. So let's look for an understanding of where those noise limits come from. As I've drawn them, they don't look very important. In fact, this shallow one ends up being pretty important, ends up showing up above the shot noise in um, a non-negligible and otherwise very valuable frequency, frequency band. All right, so I want to talk first of all about the basic physics of where this comes from because I find it fascinating and it links our current um, uh, interest in thermal noise with, the, with a very rich history. And then I'll gradually focus on the aspects of the topic that are most relevant to figuring out the contribution to an interferometer noise budget. All right, we've seen that. So, I, it may, we go back as far as Newton in this set of lectures, so I can't say that going back to 1827 takes us farther back in history than we've done, but it's pretty far back. Um, there was a crisis in science uh, created by the observations of Robert Brown, um, who was working at a time when you could still say that I'm a scientist and my special specialty is microscopy. His job was just to see what he could see through microscopes, okay? um, which I think is kind of charming. Uh, but he was a very good microscopist, especially in the sense that he noticed what many other people from 
fr from Van Leeuwenhoek onward must have seen in their microscopes but not noticed. Uh, remember, as soon as the microscope was invented, people went wild with the discoveries, and in particular, they discovered little animals, little swimming single-celled creatures, right? This was a tremendous scientific revolution that we sh uh, uh, should not underestimate. But was w what was lost in all that excitement until Brown pointed it out in 1827 was that even if you get really, really pure, clean water that you're going to look at in your microscope, so you're really sure that you don't have any little animals swimming around and you just have little grains of dust, the grains of dust look like they're swimming around. Which either means everything is alive, <laughs> don't laugh, that was the favorite explanation, or there's something other than life that causes things to move in water. Um, Brown actually thought it meant that everything was alive. And he thought he could have a good test case by taking uh, a little rock that someone brought back from a vacation in Egypt, a rock from the Great Sphinx. And he ground up a powder from that rock and put that in his clean water. And he said, wow, even that swims around. It must be that everything is alive. All right. Uh, I don't know. I don't understand his chain of reasoning, actually. But I thought it was interesting that that's, well, we've criticized Michelson, one of my great heroes, so we can make fun of this guy, <laughs> too. Um, most people didn't buy that. There was, for a long time, a guess that the, what the answer ought to be was some sort of root N effect. We keep coming up with root Ns um, in this class. From the fact that these visible bits of dust they were big enough to be seen under a microscope, were suspended in water, and that the water itself was made up of discrete parts, namely molecules. And in any given moment, in any given interval of time, call it a second, just by random chance, you might have a few more collisions from the right-hand side than from the left. So the dust particle moves left for a bit, and then in another interval of time, by chance, you'll get a few more hits in the other direction, and you get, let's see, this pattern called a random walk. And it wasn't just Brown who did this. I got this from uh, a book by the Nobel Prize winner Auguste Perrin, uh, who devoted his life to studying Brownian motion, and that meant either he or his graduate students would sit at a microscope and take a piece of graph paper and say, okay, that dust particle moved here, 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 all right? And the book is full of these diagrams. So you think your research projects are boring? Think if you were working for Auguste Perrin and you had to make accurate diagrams of random walks. Nevertheless, this is true. All right, so besides Brown, people guessed that this was an effect of molecular collisions. But doing the math right, well, I don't know if I'm going to call it the math or the physics. Every time people tried to calculate the effect, they didn't get the right answer. So there was this hypothesis around people says, got to be right, got to be right. But uh, quantities didn't work out. Um, and it was only, oh, well, there's another set of data. There's three random walks. Okay. Um, so, so it was a live field of research, a crisis, where we don't really have a model that, that fits the data. This is um, a summary of many such paths. Okay, so let's see. This one I see a beginning and an end. So one thing you could do to try to extract something meaningful from data like that is to say, I'm going to measure 100 or 1,000 of these, and then reduce everything to how far did the dust particle move from the beginning of one time interval to, to the end. So here is some data that asks the question, OK, how many dots are there? Several hundred. Uh, I'm going to put a dot on this kind of graph where I, I put it uh, at a distance from the center 
corresponding to that distance. And look, I'm gonna keep track of the angle too. So fortunately it was isotropic, so it wasn't that crazy. Well, you declare where they start, the center, okay? So, um, I, all right, this one started here, this one started here, you just suppress where it started, and just measure, measure radius and, and angle. All right, and so you had to ask, um, is there any pattern in there? Um, the hope was what you were looking at was some sort of Gaussian with a width. And then the next question was, did the width of that pattern vary in a systematic way as you uh, increased the time over which you observed the path? So now, here is another version of, of that uh, question of, of drift, uh, drift velocity or drift distance versus time. So here we have time in seconds and here are a bunch of individual paths where we've just got distance. So we've suppressed the, um, everything but a radial coordinate. And boy, we're looking at noise. It's hard to find patterns in noise. But the suggestion of these red lines is that what you're seeing is what you would expect from a true random walk. Namely, the mean square displacement is proportional to the time. Um, other experiments where the data isn't so pictorial, so it isn't so easy for me to show you, showed that there was a temperature dependence and that to the extent that you could control the amount of drag or friction that a particle would feel moving through the fluid, uh, you could change the amount of, of drift. Now all of these systematics smelled like the molecular explanation. And it was finally Einstein in the thing that really made him famous in 1905 was cracking the Brownian motion problem. Okay, people didn't know what to do with relativity and people weren't sure where the photoelectric effect was gonna go. Maybe that was just you know some bizarre corner of physics that won't be interesting. But everyone knew why Brownian motion was important. And Einstein figured out the right way to make abstractions from the data that didn't run into the problem. I think I can summarize what the problem had been. Everyone else's calculation for what Brownian motion would be if the molecular explanation was right was a prediction about the velocity, the instantaneous velocity of the dust particles. And what they didn't realize was the human eye doesn't, is not a very good way of spotting velocity through a microscope because you know, we go to the movies and nobody notices that things are going at 30 frames a second, which means that your visual system does a lot of averaging so that blinks of a 30th of a second or smaller, you don't see. And people didn't register that idea and they didn't realize they were averaging and that there was a huge velocity back and forth at very high frequencies that they couldn't see. So Einstein's great insight was to focus on the mean square displacement which doesn't care about whether your eye is, is averaging because you're doing something even longer. You're saying, okay, I'll, I'll see how far it goes in one second, two, three, four. So here was Einstein's law of Brownian motion that said, I can calculate why it is that we, under, we can understand data that shows that the mean square displacement is proportional to T and lo and behold, he linked it to parameters of microphysics. That is to say, I don't think he actually used that notation. Um, he used another notation that made it clear, let's see if I have this written any place else. Um, he used another notation which would be better if I'd put that on the slide, that made it clear that what he was gonna find was actually how many molecules of water there were in a given cubic centimeter. Nobody knew that up until this point. In 1905, the molecular hypothesis or the atomic hypothesis of matter was what, it was a bigger controversy than is string theory right today, all right? 
there were people said, look, chemistry shows Dalton's laws of chemistry with the integer ratios and reactions. That is just the clearest indication that there's something discrete at, at the bottom of nature. And other people said, oh, it could just be a symmetry principle and, you know, uh, that's probably just some abstraction that you're applying and we'll never know because you can never observe things that tiny as hypothetical molecules. But once you could demonstrate that you had a real shot noise effect, in particular what it showed was what was the, what was the amount of momentum in an individual bump. And that amount of momentum in an individual bump, Einstein could back out and say, you know what? In a mole of a substance, you've got 6 times 10 to the 23 molecules. And that was the fantastic thing. It was at that moment that people could believe that atoms were real. We forget that, but that was um, one of the, the, the most important discoveries of the 20th century. Okay. Even though it was, people had guessed it for, for over a century before. And along the way then, you understand what heat is, it's thermal energy is the random vibrations, the random motions of molecules. So much fell into place after this. So another indication of how important this was, this was part of Einstein's Nobel Prize. But Auguste Perrin, the guy who wrote the book with all those pictures, he also got a Nobel Prize for studies of Brownian motion, okay? So two Nobel Prizes, or one and a third at least, um, for this topic. So uh, that's an indication of how important people thought it was. Yeah, okay, so yeah, so Perrin, I'm sorry, I, called, I misspoke his name, Jean Perrin, 1926 Nobel Prize. Okay, and not, not much later, um, people started realizing that if there really was a discrete structure, an atomic structure to all of nature, um, that there would be other manifestations. And so the fact that there should be electrical Brownian motion in electrical components, which we now call Johnson noise after Mr. Johnson who said, yeah, you know that noise that every resistor has no matter what? I can understand it. It's the thermally driven motion of the, uh, of the electrons uh, moving back and forth in, in my resistor. So, so the generalizations came pretty soon. Um, yeah? No, no, it's not entirely that, just like the noise in LIGO is not entirely the thermal noise. But nevertheless, every resistor in every circuit has a voltage noise that is its Johnson noise. So, yeah, it's one of the fundamental noises. Um, yes? Do even superconductors have this? I'm sorry? Do even superconductors show this noise? Do superconductors? I don't think so. Um, but ask someone who knows better. Um, this depends on, on resistance and is the, uh, uh, let me not say anymore. I don't, I don't think it's applicable. I mean, that's a completely quantum coherent thing. So, um, so I don't know that the, that the assumptions that go into this, this has to do with, um, you know, with randomness that quantum mechanics can do something different with. But in Johnson noise, probably what is happening is the thermal phonons mm -hmm. are giving random kicks to the electrons. Yes, so that's yeah, the right. Right. Phonons themselves have a thermal spectrum. They're mm -hmm. getting kicked about. Yeah. Uh, the electrons are getting kicked about. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, the electrons surely have to be in thermal equilibrium with the rest of the system, and that's probably what, what maintains it. Did you have a question, uh, too? Uh, I got answered. Yeah. Okay. I, I just wanted to ask what, what you meant by electrical equivalent. Is it, again, caused by heat? The yes, yes. Um, and, yeah, and right, right. So, right. So, there is, so there is the... There is the answer. All right, so first a discovery of microscopy and then the first hint of a generalization beyond the question of, of dust grains in, in water drops. Um, 
And the next major step um, in, in generalizing this idea came in the early 50s. There's two or three papers written by a guy named Callan with, uh, with different, uh, different collaborators each, each time, um, who said, if you have any linear system that's in thermal equilibrium, and if you can identify a variable that looks like a velocity, and another variable that, that uh, is the driver, like a force, of, of that velocity, and he generalized it pretty well. Let me just say, force and velocity is one pair, the explicitly named ones, but voltage and current are another pair. Um, and in one of these papers, he lists about eight different kinds of physical systems. He said, okay, let's call this kind, this variable of velocity, and here's the force that's conjugate to it. And now, when you have a force-velocity pair, anytime you have that, there it, you can identify a way in which the equivalent of the random hits of the molecules of the water or the random bumps of the phonons in the structure of, of, of the resistor cause you to have a power spectrum of fluctuations. And he gave an exact formula for what the power spectrum of those thermally driven fluctuations should be. It's marked as thermal by having a KT out in front. And then the rest of it tells you physics of the system and what aspect of the physics of the system carries the thermal energy um, of KT. And the, and, and the key way of characterizing the system is to describe the dynamics of the system in terms of a frequency domain function called the admittance, whose meaning I will explain in a moment. But the basic definition is if I have my linear system I, and I can determine in the frequency domain how much velocity, either real velocity or this equivalent velocity variable like current, how much velocity I get for a given driving force. And this is a frequency domain function, so this is a function of f that can have a real part and an imaginary part or a magnitude and a phase. So if you know the admittance and in particular, you pay attention to the real part of the admittance, and we'll come back to what that means in a moment. That's the thing you plug in to the right-hand side, and uh, that determines what is the power spectrum of thermally driven fluctuations of that system. Yes? How do we make sense of the power spectrum? How do we make Um, precisely that, that in the Brownian motion case, um, the position is what you can see. And you, of course, if you wanted to see things at 100 hertz, you need a better uh, way of observing it than your eye. But yes, that's literally supposed to be the velocity of the Brownian particle, first as a function of time, and then um, form the power spectrum out uh, in the ways that we talked about yesterday either the um, Fourier transform or the autocorrelation function of that, of that time series or the norm squared of, of the Fourier transform of a, of a bunch of instances. So it is literally, in the mechanical case, literally the, the velocity as, as best you can measure it. Ah. Variable x, whose time derivative is like the velocity. Yeah. So that variable I'm sorry. x, it's uh, uh, expectation value x squared is x of x. So x of x is the power spectrum of that variable whose time derivative is. Is v. Yeah. Okay. Th yes. Thank you. If that was the needed clarification, that was an excellent clarification. Yeah. Ajit. Um, all right. So this is supposed to be, okay, I'm sorry. Here is a microscopic dust particle surrounded by this water. 
what we're supposed to imagine is that I can reach in with tiny tweezers and apply a sinusoidal driving force to this and find out what is the response as a function of frequency. Now, the dynamics of a dust particle in water are really simple. It's only drag. It's only the, the friction, the viscosity of the, of the fluid. So for that case, I can even tell you, well, all right, it's whatever dimension, properly dimensioned thing is proportional to viscosity. It's the drag coefficient. It's what we expect is F equals minus BV, okay? So B is something we can calculate for us, spherical particle, and it involves the viscosity. So let's form the ratio. V over F, and um, so there is the admittance, which only has a real part in this case. Okay, so for the classic Brownian case, I would just plug in one over whatever the, the friction coefficient happens happens to be. Yes? An external driving force, yes. But uh, in this case, this, uh, this, is that this F is point. the internal, it should be the case at equivalent, right? Where external force is equal to the small and medium. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll, 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 do a, I'll do a more complete example where I did it out in advance and we'll, and we'll see how it, how it works out. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Let's, we'll, we'll, we'll get to an example in a moment. All right. How about if, yeah, since it came up, let's do it for for a harmonic oscillator. And I want to do it, that's a lot of steps. I don't want you to look at all steps at once. I will copy them onto board slowly. Oops, no, press any other button. Um, AV mute. All right, I'll copy, we'll do it together and we'll see how it works out. So, Precisely, let's start here. Does this look familiar? Okay, does this like the, look like the equation of motion for a uh, simple harmonic oscillator? All right, now, this is the way we physicists are taught to do it. Pay attention to the X. Whoever invented this admittance idea, and let me just mention that more people have heard of impedance. Impedance and admittance are inverses of the other. Okay. I don't know the history of why the velocity variable was chosen as opposed to keeping force and X but so be it. So what we're invited to do is replace the x's by v's. Um, yeah. Times. where I used that I omega x equals x dot equals v. Okay? So does anyone want to ask a question about this step? No, we're good, right? Or not? So, uh, so we're assuming that x is sinus. I'm sorry? 
Are we assuming that x is sinusoid? Yes. Is yes. As soon as 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 soon as soon as I go to uh, the frequency domain, which I'm just in the process of doing, we're going to assume that my test force is sinusoidal, and everything else is going to be sinusoidal as well. All right. Only one frequency at a time, or that we do the math as if it's one frequency at a time, and then know that we've learned things about Fourier transforms that then can super, um, superpose all sorts of frequencies at once. But for now, for as we go through the derivation, think of it as something you can do one frequency at a time. So F is also one frequency. F. Yes, yes. This is driven by a, a signal generator where I turn the knob to pick the frequency I want, and then I measure what's the velocity response in magnitude and phase. All right, so I already started cheating and, and putting in i omegas. Let me finish. Okay, that looks right. How about if I collect terms, put all my Vs um, together? All right. I'll write expressions both for Z and for F, or, or, and, for, and for Y. And this is the thing that's called the impedance. Um, and the admittance is 1 over the impedance, or simply OK? Now. We're kind of done, except we're going to be invited to identify the real part of this object. And right now, I've got a complex thing in the denominator, so I want to rationalize the denominator and get an expression that makes so, uh, that where we can pull out real and imaginary parts. And it's just one more line of algebra that I think we'll trust each other that we can each do. And let me write the answer that I got that I'm pretty sure is right. So y is equal to The admittance of a simple harmonic oscillator. Questions on the calculation? On the concept? And then, okay, 
Then when we want to plug in to the fluctuation dissipation theorem, we identify the real part by just paying attention to this part of the numerator. And now let's ponder this. Well, should we ponder it or should we go back and do the whole? Um, let's finish plugging it in. I'll copy this. So the power spectrum, and now I'm going to switch to uh, F. Should I do that? Yeah, I'm going to switch to, the, to using explicit Fs. So for K Boltzmann T over 2 pi F squared times 2 pi F squared times V over M All right, so Callan taught us if, I've, if we've got a simple harmonic oscillator with spring constant K mass M and velocity damping coefficient B, what will be the inevitable fluctuation power spectrum for the coordinate of the mass due to the fact that that mass is being buffeted in some way by parts that have energies that come from being in equilibrium at temperature T. So anything at non-zero temperature is going to have a kind of a noise like this. And in particular, we're interested in mechanical things, electrical things, optical things. Um, the, the applications are are, are numerous. Now, what can we learn about this kind of is from staring at this expression? What kind of spectral character does it have? At lower temperature, you yes. There's an overall factor of temperature. And B can be lower, but notice B is also in the denominator. So it's, well, it will, th the dependence on B is interesting. Okay, that's interesting, but this is direct. T just shows up here as a prefactor. Um, yes, okay. It's, it, uh, it is a noise that, um, that has, has a, a, a strong frequency dependence. Um, yeah. So why don't we just cancel those, make it look simpler. Um, so now, if I were going to sketch the spectrum without trying to put numbers on the axes, what would we say about, about the character? In the limit that frequency goes to zero, It's right. It's this goes away, that goes away. So it's some constant. Okay, so there's a region at low enough frequency that it's some constant. All right. At high frequencies, let's ignore that, let's ignore that. Right. The power spectrum goes like 1 over F to the fourth, which means that the amplitude spectral density would go like 1 over frequency squared. Sound familiar? Okay. And what about the intermediate frequency where m times 2 pi f squared is close to k? So why does this look familiar? Yesterday we saw what? What was the object that where the graph looked the same. It was which? Yes, it was the, the frequency response. 
of a simple harmonic oscillator. So what it looks like we're seeing, and this has exactly the same spectral shape. So what it looks like we've got is the frequency response of that simple harmonic oscillator being driven by a frequency independent influence whose magnitude is given by the prefactors here. And so we see that frequency response come to life as if it were alive, okay? Um, now, the question is, um, what can we do to um, manipulate this? And since I'm already asserting that we know it's going to turn into a problem in our gravity wave detectors, Yes. Why should there be a king in the This this is what I meant to draw. Why is there a resonance? It's, it's whatever this function is, right? This resonance denominator you've encountered like every day of since your first year of physics, okay? And we'll talk, all right, how about this? Let's, let's focus precisely on, on that question. All right. Is it dark enough in the room for people to see these chart recorder traces? Um, all right, let me tell you what, what we've got here. Um, this is one of the most amazing anticlimactic experiments ever done. This, okay, this was done by a guy named R.V. Jones who understood perfectly well the exact answer he was gonna get, but somebody he thought was a fool had predicted that some different answer would happen. So he says, I'm gonna prove you're a fool by actually doing the experiment and publishing the result. So um, let me say what he did and maybe I can tell you what the bet was that, that he won. Um, so. It used to be that the best ammeters in the laboratory, current meters, were mechanical systems called galvanometers. And they consisted of some leads from the circuit whose current you wanted to measure that came into a little coil near some magnet. And that magnet was suspended from a very fine wire so that even a tiny current would make a non-negligible torque on that magnet sitting near the coil. And then to read it out, because you're looking for really small things, glued to either the magnet or the wire was a little mirror. And through a telescope, you would see whether that mirror was lined up with the zero on a ruler across the room or, or, or something else, okay? From the point of view of just the mechanics, forgetting that it was a designed and used in the laboratory as an electrical measuring institute, instrument, from the point of view of the mechanics, you could think of it as a tiny moment of inertia suspended at the end of a torsion fiber whose mechanical role is to be a torsional spring. So if you think about the angular coordinate as the, co as the position coordinate, this is an angular spring fighting against or, or, or constraining the, the motion of um, a, an object with mass and length so it has a moment of inertia. So this is just the angular equivalent of a mass on a spring. So moment of inertia on a torsional spring. So it's a mechanical system that ought to have precisely this um, uh, kind of power spectrum except you would write it S theta of F instead of Sx of F. Okay, so you're with me so far. All right, now, if you want to use this as a current measuring device in the laboratory, you kind of want it to swing to the new angle and sit there. So people, when they designed these, always put in a fair amount of damping so that instead of going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth a lot every time you put in a new current, it would reach the new value. 
But for different purposes, people said, oh, I would rather have a quick response. And then somebody said, no, I want it to be well damped so I don't get confused by oscillations. So the damping coefficient for most galvanometers was something you could choose. And the choice was made by a resistor that you put um, in the electrical part. Uh, of, of, the, of the measuring thing. You could just swap in different resistors and change the amount of damping. So we're going to get precisely to the point of how, what happens when you adjust B. All right, so here drawn as a graph is angle as a function of time, but you can think of it as position as a function of time for a, uh, a mass, a regular mass on a spring. For three different damping coefficients of a galvanometer. So without any current applied? Right, without any current applied. Just close the terminals. So it's not being used as a measuring instrument. It's being used as something that exhibits Brownian motion. Good. Thanks for the clarification. All right. So are those three time traces similar or different? Okay, what's special about the middle one? It's almost periodic. If you just look at a cycle or two, you might think it's a sinusoid. But is it really a sinusoid? No. Okay, but it's quasi-periodic. Okay, so with that in mind as a description of the middle one, what about the bottom one? Or what about the top one? Same or different? Similar or different? Clearly they're not the same. They're different instances, okay? Similar or different? Who wants to vote for similar? Between one and three, yeah. Okay. okay, who wants to vote for different? All right. Similar voters, what's similar about them? Uh, that frequency is still there. That, uh, you can kind of see that frequency still there. Okay, anything else that's similar among the three? Similar voters, defend your vote. Don't be shy. You raised your hand. There is something similar about them. Don't be shy. What's similar about those three traces? No, no it's, it's not. But what, what might make you think it could be that? The, yes, the mean square amplitude of those is the same. So they are similar. Now, people who voted for different, in what ways are they different? The, the degree to which it looks like it's sort of a harmonic oscillator, not quite such a good oscillator. Uh, is there really anything left of an oscillator or not? So you're both right. They are both similar and different. Now, here is a power spectral representation. I think I probably took the square root. It's probably amplitude spectral density um, of those three different cases. In what way are they similar and in what way are they different? It's got, okay, same one over, oh, we can tell whether I did this. So in this decade, and it goes from there to there. Yeah, this is the amplitude spectral density. It just goes like one over frequency squared. Okay, um, so they've got the same slope at high frequencies, one over frequency squared in the amplitude spectral density or one over F to the fourth in the power spectrum. What about at low frequencies? Same. What about the normalizations? I mean, is the value of the power at low frequencies the same or different? It's different. Is the value of the power at high frequencies same or different? Okay, what about near the resonance? Same or different? Same resonant Sorry? Same resonant for the width of? Same resonant frequency, but the width is different. Interesting, huh? 
All right. Now, here's a question. Is anyone good enough at reading log log graphs to actually integrate under those three curves? This is an example where a log log thing only gets you so far. If you wanted to actually check, ah, here's something that I think I forgot to mention yesterday. The integral of a power spectrum is the mean square variation of the noise thing. Okay, that's a theorem. Okay, so I, I'm sorry? Those three cases are three different dampings applied to the same mass and spring. Right, so now let's go back. And now we're ready to precisely to talk about the point that, that, that you were eager to have us talk about. All right, let me hit the AV mute again. All right. If we're far from the resonance, okay, so if we're either in the high frequency regime where only this matters or the low frequency regime where only this matters, then it's correct that if you lower the damping, the spectrum goes down, all right? The, the spectrum with the sharpest spike was the one with the lowest wings, both at low frequency and high frequency. We'll check that again in a moment when, when, when we go back and look at the, si the slide. However, in the vicinity of the resonance, very low damping makes the noise go up. All right, this is the lowest value of B. So far from the resonance, either low or high, low B means low noise. We can tell it's low B because it's the sharpest peak. But in the vicinity of that sharp peak, low damping means high noise. Remember what we could see with our eyes more easily here in the time domain. These have the same mean square value. It's harder to see in the frequency domain unless I had plotted this on a linear linear scale instead of a log log scale. But I assure you, these have the same three integrals underneath them. So now, what does this say about the right way to make, uh, about the galvanometer, okay. So, what does this say about noise in the galvanometer? Does it depend on damping or not? It does depend on damping, but it depends in a way that doesn't change the overall angular excursion of of the noise, it only changes the spectral character. At low damping, it concentrates almost all of the noise at the resonant frequency. As Patrick said, look, that low damping case, it looks quasi-sinusoidal. This is the signature of a quasi-sinusoid in a spectrum, a narrow peak. It says almost all the fluctuations happen in very near vicinity of this frequency. It means it looks like a sign. On the other hand, if you go to high damping, you spread the excursions out over lots of different frequencies. Not that much of it is concentrated near the resonance. And so the question is, depending on what you care about, maybe you want to pick high damping or maybe you're in a situation where you want to pick low damping. Now, let's not try to get to the end point of that as it applies to gravity wave detectors yet. But let's just make sure we understand the physics here. All right. I want to ask everyone to go back to their thermodynamics and statistical mechanics and try to think of the two or three deepest things you know about how how fluctuations happen. 
Has anyone ever heard of something called the equipartition theorem? Okay. What does the equipartition theorem say? The equipartition says that every degree of freedom, or at least every degree of freedom associated with a quadratic term in the Hamiltonian, has an energy that you can know that depends only on t, half kt. This says nothing about the amount of damping. All right? It says nothing about the dynamics whatsoever of that degree of freedom. It doesn't depend on the resonant frequency of anything or even if there is a spring. It could just be a Brownian particle in some fluid. Um, doesn't matter. The amount of energy associated with the thermal disturbance of some degree of freedom is just kT over 2. How is that consistent? How is that even possibly true? Is that agree with this or in conflict with this? How many vote for conflict? How many vote for agreement? Ah, oh, everyone's shy now. All right. I want to assert that it's in perfect agreement. It is because what is it that's the same about all three of these? It's their mean square displacement. What the equipartition theorem says is that the energy that's associated with the twist of that wire or the stretch of our spring is 1 half kx squared. That has an expectation value of a half kt. Well, all right, let's kill the halves, move the spring constant down there, and I've got a mean square value of x equal to kt over, over spring constant. k Boltzmann t over spring constant. So the equipartition theorem tells you that these should have the same mean square scatter. But it is silent on the spectral character. So we didn't change, or Mr. Jones didn't change the temperature between this case, this case, and this case. All he changed was the damping. So those changes could not change the mean square scatter because that's what's governed by the equipartition theorem saying half kt's worth of energy associated with that degree of freedom. But by changing the amount of damping, he changed how that, those fluctuations were spread across the spectrum or changed what the time trace looked like. But now here's where I would say, here's where I would say that being able to fluently switch back and forth between the time domain and the frequency domain is the best way to have physical insight, okay? Because to my eye, once one knows to look um, at that, seeing that those three traces have the same mean square displacement is kind of obvious. It's not so obvious here because of the way I plotted it, but even so, that's the traditional way to plot a power spectrum. On the other hand, I just know something's funny about that top trace, that it really doesn't look like an oscillator at all. But when I look at this representation, the frequency domain representation of that noise process, I'm able to say, oh yeah, I get it, right. It spread the energy more evenly over a range of frequencies and taken, taken the fluctuations to some degree or maybe a large degree away from the resonant frequency and, and that's what we've done. Okay. So this is kind of a rich subject, right? It's rich and it's rich in a, in a universal way. It doesn't matter which kind of physical system I choose This theorem applies to it, as well as the equipartition theorem applies to it. And I can know what the 
power spectrum of thermally driven fluctuations is for any system so long as I can either calculate or measure the real part of its admittance. And I know this. And I know along the way it's going to be consistent with the ecopartition theorem. But this contains a lot more information than the ecopartition theorem. I can do the integral of this and recover the ecopartition theorem, or I can use the full form and say I know at every frequency whether I'm going to have a lot of noise or a little noise. I, s I see an unhappy face. You look like you're wondering. Ab Mm -hmm. Okay, you're saying it's it's about a, it's about an average over ensembles yeah, or something. Yes. Yeah. You have damping. Yeah. You have damping. Mm -hmm. That arises from the coupling of phonon microscopically to the these particles. Okay. Phonons of uh, the vibration mode of these atoms of fluid. Mm -hmm. To the okay. Atoms. Okay. In that case, until unless you just neglect that damping damping coefficient. If the particles theorem cannot be applied, in the sense, if the particles are completely independent, what about it? I mean, interaction is there. If the partition theorem can be applied, as soon as there is a correlation whatsoever. Okay. This I I think this applies to one particle at a time, but the many particles you're talking about are an ensemble that lets you make sense of the average. Is that what you're saying? Okay. What he's trying to say is that the equipartition theorem statistical mechanics yes. was derived assuming that the total energy is conserved. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, in a, let's say, micro canonical ensemble. Okay. Is conserved, and you derive it. But when there is damping, we know that there is dissipation of energy. All right. But, so but okay. But I'm, no, I'm not sure I'm going to, I'm not going to buy that entirely yet. Okay. Because. The equipartition theorem only makes sense if I've got one particular degree of freedom in equilibrium with a heat bath, okay? So that heat bath has a gazillion degrees of freedom and energy is coming in and out. And let's look at this. Honestly, I'm not sure I buy this. Let's look at this case. Here's a short amount of time where it's swinging a lot. And now here's a couple of seconds where it's not swinging very much. So Energy is not conserved for this degree of freedom. Its energy is coming in and out through the coupling to the heat bath. Um, it's right. It's one. It's one macroscopic degree of freedom coupled to a heat bath. Okay. So I don't see manifest energy conservation in the degree of freedom I'm paying attention to. I'm not disagreeing with energy conservation in the universal sense, but it's, it's, it's not manifest here. What's manifest here is energy coming in and out of a heat bath, driving fluctuations. These, these what? These fluctuations are calculated using Parseval's identity to transform Oh, I don't know. That's big math for me. This is this is data. There's 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 no identities applied applied to this. So I'm am sorry. I'm, I'm maybe not missing. I'm not, maybe not getting the point of your question. Yes. Okay. All right. Um, Here's how, how, tell me if this is responsive to your question. For, for me to apply the equipartition theorem, I just need to identify one degree of freedom where I know that its term in the system's Hamiltonian is this particular quadratic form. I don't really need to know anything else about the rest of the system except the quadratic nature of that one degrees of freedom term in the Hamiltonian and that it is in thermal equilibrium with the heat bath. Okay, so, so it's pr I think it's pretty easy to apply when your system is simple enough that you can say, ah, okay, there is a variable that 
just is associated with potential energy of one half kx squared. Okay, if I can spot a simple harmonic oscillator, then I can apply the equipartition theorem. So I would say that there's more complicated mathematics in the fluctuation dissipation theorem, but it's much more powerful in general because I can take something that doesn't have mode structure at all. I can take something that involves 20 modes or even have the mode thing break down and nevertheless I can calculate the power spectrum of the noise if I know the admittance. And that admittance could either be calculated from some model or it could be strictly measured in the sense that we were talking about yesterday because we're talking about linear systems with an input and an output and maybe I've got a very complicated linear system on my lab bench but I've identified an input and an output and I measure the complex ratio of V over F or F over V, find the appropriate, the, the real part of the admittance, and boom, I can numerically plot a spectrum. So, so uh, does this work when we are considering, say, admittance, say when we consider a 3D block? Uh, a 3D block, so yes. A cube of yeah. Uh-huh. And we are trying to find our admittance in one direction. So okay. So ah, all right. So let, I, let, I was thinking in that direction. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Excellent. Okay, let, let, me, let me just slightly change your question. What if we had a cylindrical piece of glass and we wanted to identify the height, well, position, because maybe in the end I'm going to interrogate horizontal. So I've got a cylinder. I'm picturing a LIGO mirror. Okay, so now here's this flat face that I want to use as the mirror of this thing that is a Michelson interferometer mirror and a test mass for a gravity wave detector. And the question is, do I, if I care about fluctuations of the position along this horizontal axis of the front face of the mirror, is this telling me about thermally driven fluctuations of that front face of the mirror? And the answer is yes, it is because So here is the spot whose coordinate I care intensely about. Now, let's say I did an experiment. I would never do this with a real LIGO mirror. Even to draw it makes me cringe. <laughs> I put my thumb on the front surface of the mirror and move my thumb sinusoidally against that, applying a sinusoidal force to the front surface of the mirror. Do you think that it will respond and have some steady state sinusoidal velocity in response to the fo sinusoidal force I apply? The answer is yes. At low frequencies where it's easier to picture, I would mainly be exciting the pendulum mode. At high frequencies that I can't really do with my thumb, the pendulum mode drops out, this is a lot of inertia, the center of mass doesn't recoil at all, but due to the elasticity of the material out of which the mirror is made, there is nevertheless a small but important response of the front surface due to compression of the glass out of which the mirror is made. So this is very much applicable to things that are more complicated than discrete component things where you say this is a mass, this is a spring. It's hard to identify a separate part of a mass or a spring and here's where it comes back to the first part of your question. There are resonant modes of the mirror. In the advanced LIGO mirrors the lowest one is 6 kilohertz. But not far above the lowest one is another mode and another and another and they get very crowded. So crowded that people who tried to use intuition just using modal analysis, such as myself, the first time I thought about this problem, completely failed to appreciate how, how rich the problem is and how it, intractable it is if you try to think about it as it, with individual normal modes. But individual normal modes don't enter into the statement of the fluctuation dissipation theorem. All you need to know is, is there in fact a well-defined admittance? with a non-zero real part. 
If there is, and it doesn't matter whether you calculate it, measure it, whatever, so long as you know it, then you know there will be fluctuations given by that amplitude. And so what this means in particular is due to the fact that you can compress the mirror at high frequencies and that there is some internal friction in the glass so that we'll end up with a non-zero real part of that admittance that there is a non-negligible fluctuation of the front surface of the mirror that in principle could mask gravity waves and could ruin everything we're trying to do. So your question was a, was a brilliant one. Um, yes? So you said you can measure this uh, admittance. Yes. So you would apply them to all the measure the velocity? But yeah, that's, if you were going to measure it, if someone's going to let you do this, yeah. you could do it. All right? Now, as it turns out, even though it's not tractable to modal analysis, um, you can, with enough math from the theory of elasticity, actually calculate this. So calculating it is, is better since these are too expensive, but yes, you, you can model it, yes. Um, it's not a simple harmonic oscillator. No, it's, right, it's not a simple harmonic oscillator and it's not easy to model as a superposition of many oscillators, although people have tried, but all you need to do is measure the admittance and plug it into the darn theorem. Measure or calculate either way. Yes. You are going to decrease the temperature to kill mm -hmm. the Okay. Why not have resonant bar detectors as the mirrors? And, and, and what? The surface as the mirror. Mm -hmm. So it's a heavy thing. So you have. Okay. It, if you're going to do that, why make them as mirrors of the, of the, of the interferometer? It's not. So you And also, also measure the, fluctu oh, the resonant fluctuation. Only is a yeah. Resonant bar detectors okay. There is a supernova at one kilohertz. Yeah. All right. Let's talk about that over lunch. I don't. I don't see the advantage. All right. But let's talk about the thing you said first. Maybe what you ought to do is lower the temperature. Okay. And in fact, the Kagura interferometer that's being put together in Japan right now is following that. Um, uh, that strategy. However, let me critique that strategy. This is a power spectrum. The power spectrum is proportional to one power of t, or the amplitude spectral density is proportional to the square root of t. But, all right, so how far can you reduce the temperature? If you go crazy, you can maybe take the temperature from 300 Kelvin down to about 3 Kelvin, right? temperature of liquid helium. Kagra won't get that far. They'll go to, I don't know, 30 or 40 Kelvin. So maybe they're going to get a factor of 10 in the temperature or a factor of 3 in the noise. Now, for some purposes, I would kill to reduce crucial noise by a factor of 3. So it's not ill-motivated by any means, but it's not a panacea because there's only so much you can do with the temperature. Now, also though, implicit in this is that if my strategy is reduce the temperature, I want to make sure that nothing else about the admittance depends on the temperature in a way that might spoil things. Now, let me complicate matters. What if Kagra didn't know what they know and what you won't know until 30 seconds from now, and they made their mirrors out of glass like we do in LIGO and Virgo? What they would find out is what they know and what we know. Namely that the dissipation, the friction, the equivalent of the B factor in glass gets much worse at low temperatures than it is at room temperature. Okay? So even though this is just hanging out there saying, change me, change me, change me, it's not obvious that that is the best thing to do. What's the other thing that we can do? We can lower B, right? So the strategy that advanced LIGO took was to try to find what formulations of glass had the lowest amounts of internal friction, 
the property that governs the real part of the admittance for this experiment. And we found that there were formulations of glass that were practicable to make and affordable to buy where the amount of dissipation was a lot lower than ever before. And we took advantage of the fact that even at fixed temperature and fixed everything else, if you reduce the amount of dissipation, you don't change the overall mean square fluctuation, but what you do is just concentrate all that noise in one narrow frequency bin that's going to swing like crazy or swing like a half kT. But otherwise, at every other frequency, you can make the noise lower and lower in proportion to how much you can reduce the mechanical friction, the mechanical dissipation. So the strategy that we've used up to now in advanced LIGO is find the best glass for this purpose. The strategy that Kagra is pioneering is to say, well, that just means you better not use glass. You better use some more sensible material like crystalline sapphire that doesn't have that perverse property of ruining what happens when you go to low temperature. So they've developed a whole new optics technology of fabricating, polishing, coating sapphire mirrors and had to engineer all the low temperature uh, parts to cool those mirrors to low temperature even when you shine kilowatts of light onto the surfaces of those mirrors. It's doable. I'm not saying it's a bad thing to do, but it's not as obvious that it's the best thing to do at any given stage of technology. That there's at least these two competing strategies, lower T and lower the dissipation. Um, so, uh, yes? Uh, you just mentioned that uh, kilowatt, shiny kilowatt would be able. So uh, wouldn't that also suppose, uh, in LIGO it's at 300 uh, at room temperature, right? Uh, yes, 300 Kelvin, right. So if we shine the lid, wouldn't that be? Yeah, it warms up, but not a lot. It warms up a few degrees. Which so, that, so that's obviously taken into account. Yeah, right, 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 right. It's, it's more of a problem for, for a cryogenic thing because the same amount of power absorbed will raise the temperature more and make a much bigger effect. Uh, but they've taken this into account in their design. So, so I think all the, the laser power has to go by either heat or scattered, right? Yes, yes. Which one dominates? And um, for most purposes, you'd rather have it end up in absorption than scattering. Yeah. And then what you'd like in this cryogenic case is make sure you've got enough thermal conduction from the mirrors so that a given power absorbed makes the smallest temperature rise that, that you can get away with. Yeah. All right. So pretty cool physics from a really general theorem that turns out to be both applicable to what we're doing and to have the richness of it make us try to say, well, what engineering path should we follow to make it small? Um, all right, let me see what else I wanted to say. This is a Mackey doubt that fluctuation dissipation theorem assumes that uh, the whole system is in a thermal bath. Yes. But in this case, the dominant uh, energy exchange which is taking place is between the mirrors and a bunch of ordered coherent photons hitting the mirrors. Mm -hmm. so There's a laser beam uh, with which the mirror is in contact. And the laser beam is really not the thermal bar. That's true. So the mirror is exchanging energy with more or less ordered form of energy. So put the fluctuation dissipation theorem uh, be, be somehow evaded. evaded? Yeah. It's a good question. I'm going to bet not, but not with much money. Okay? Um, let me say it this way. I think the kind of exchange of degrees of freedom that's the, that's the relevant thing is the fact that there's a gazillion different vibrational modes of the mirror itself. So many that thinking of them as modes isn't good except for purposes of thinking about that you've got a huge number of them. And that huge number of them constitutes the real heat bath. 
and that it's nonlinear things inside the glass that scatter energy out of one phonon into another. And some of them are really good at moving the front face of the mirror back and forth. So I'm going to guess that that does the thermalizing job that makes this at least a pretty good approximation to the truth. But I'll only bet 100 rupees. How about that? Um, Operationally, how long can the LIGO mirrors hold the power? How, how, how long do they stay in a locked state? Um, um, hours to days. Um, and you're asking that because you're thinking about how warm they get? Okay. Yeah, I, I think they reach an, an equilibrium amount of warming up in uh, an hour or two. Um, it's, it's, it's definitely a worry. I don't know that it's a worry so much for this. It's definitely a worry because the degree of curvature of the mirrors is temperature dependent and tracking that and make sure that it doesn't spoil the resonance is actually such a problem that we've got a so-called thermal compensation system that takes at least one of the mirrors in the interferometer and says, all right, as things warm up and mirror curvature change, I'm going to deliberately warm up this other thing in an appropriate way to, to make wave fronts you know, match and balance in a nice way. So you're right that temperatures change and that they drift on slow time scales and, and that it's a problem. I just, I don't imagine that it's a problem for this reason but maybe only because the temperature change is small. If it was, if it was huge, it would be more important. The entire tunnel and the big vacuum chamber yes. must be uh, cooled at some level. Need not be, uh, because ultimately for days if you're operating, keeping the locked uh, state, uh -huh. then the laser is continuously heating up the mirrors. Oh, but, so that but heat is being radiated out. Yeah, but they're in contact with the rest of the world. The world is serving as a heat bath for the, for the right. rest of that. But, uh, yeah. But, yeah. But the tunnels don't... I don't think the tunnels warm up appreciably. Um, no, not, not for that reason. Yeah. How much do the mirrors warm? I don't know, a few degrees, 10 degrees. I mean, enough to be a pain, but not enough to, to change appreciably the coefficient there. Um, let's see, we're close to lunchtime. Let's just try to see if we find a good, a good stopping point. Um, um, let's see, what, I, what do I want us to do? I want to declare that I will gather my forces and we'll pick up with some details about this and we'll do some more designing of components of an interferometer in tutorial this afternoon. But certainly time for some more questions, if there are more questions about this, the basic physics behind thermal.